Okay, so before we get started, does anybody have any questions about the assignment that's due tonight? Everybody's good? Everybody understands what you need to do? Okay, right. You've already done it, right? So, you know, there's, or at least you've already done the same thing with other texts. So this should not be an issue, right? So for Thursday, you're reading um, John Quincy Adams, Eloquence is the Child of Liberty. All right, so if there are no questions, then let's just go back to where we left off last time. So, <clears throat> Plato assembled his argument in dialogue form. It was an argument between these two other characters, Socrates and Gorgias. And what ideas about rhetoric do you put in each of these characters' mouths? Let's start with Gorgias. Is Gorgias defending or attacking rhetoric? Defending. Yeah, Gorgias is defending rhetoric, right? What does he believe rhetoric to be, and on what grounds does he defend it? What does Gorgias think rhetoric is, and why does he think it's good? back to the reading from last time, right? So Gorgias is defending the idea of rhetoric, right? What does he think rhetoric is and why does he think it's good? He defines it's like persuasive discourse. Okay, yeah. It is yeah, the art of persuasive discourse, right? So anything to do with persuasive discourse. And what else does Borges think about rhetoric? Like, what, what, why does he think rhetoric is a good thing or a positive thing? Uh, okay, on the one, yeah, it is a, he, yeah, he regards it as morally neutral, right? It's neither good nor bad in and of itself. But he says this in a way that can be read as a little bit self-serving, right? You know, he uh, notes, for example, that because rhetoric is a morally neutral tool, then you shouldn't go after the teachers of rhetoric if their students do something bad with it, right? Why is rhetoric powerful, according to Borgias? What can the rhetorician do? Yeah, because the rhetorician knows the right word and the right gesture to sway the masses, right? The rhetorician can win any argument. And the actual historical Gorgias made a kind of specialty of taking arguments that were weak on their face and making them look strong, right? That was you know, his particular stock and trade, right? What about Socrates? What does Socrates think about rhetoric? He doesn't see it like any more special than any other art. Yeah, in fact, does he see it as actually being as good or as useful as other arts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, for Socrates, rhetoric is basically a kind of counterfeit of philosophy, right? That philosophy tries to get at truth through discussion, through conversation, right? That's why Plato um, 
always uh, writes his pieces as dialogues, right? What he's uh, what he's aiming for is a process called dialectic, right? Where two disputants argue together to get at truth, right? So truth is always the goal. And what, what does he think the relationship between rhetoric and truth is? This wasn't really in the piece, but it was in our discussion of class. Like what, what did Gorgias and the other sophists believe about truth? It was like more objective, like there wasn't any one definite truth. Yeah, that there is no, that, that if there is any absolute truth, it's not knowable, right? So the best we can do is try to come as close as we can to truth through argument, right? Which is probably a more charitable way of um, describing the sophist's beliefs than Plato uses, right? So for Socrates, if truth is the goal, right, then rhetoric actually leads you away from truth. To unsubstantiated opinion, right? So you, you might recall Gorgias uses that example, right, where, uh, you know, if two men are standing for the position of state physician, Right? That the rhetorician will beat the doctor for the position because he's better able to convince the masses that he knows how to do the job, right? Now, Socrates would see this as a bad thing, right? And Socrates is Plato's mouthpiece, so we may as well note that here. Right? That no, like you shouldn't have a guy who you know, knows fuck all about medicine actually be the state physician, right? No, it should be a real physician, a real doctor. So this is a way in which rhetoric leads people away from truth, right? So Plato's view of rhetoric is a pretty dim one, right? That it is essentially kind of cesspool of opinion where unscrupulous people can manipulate the masses into doing what they want, right? Now, Aristotle is Plato's student. Does Aristotle seem to share Plato's view of rhetoric? On several points, in fact, Aristotle does seem to agree more with Gorgias than with his teacher, right? So yeah, so rhetoric is a tool. What else do, were we able to figure out Aristotle believes about rhetoric? What else does Aristotle seem to believe about rhetoric? What else does he argue about rhetoric? Uh, Plato believed rhetoric led people away from truth, right? Does Aristotle believe the same thing? What does he believe about the relationship between truth and rhetoric? You need to use like the evidence given to kind of like persuade people towards what the presented truth is, I guess. Yeah, he does talk about ways unscrupulous people can use rhetoric to make arguments, right? Um, when he talks about the sophists, um, if you look on page 133, right now the framers of the current treatises on rhetoric have constructed but a small portion of that art. The modes of persuasion are the only true constituents of the art. Everything else is merely accessory. 
These writers, however, say nothing about enthymemes, which are the substance of rhetorical persuasion, but deal mainly with non-essentials. The arousing of prejudice, pity, anger, and similar emotions has nothing to do with the essential facts, but is merely a personal appeal to the man who is judging the case. So without getting into yet like what enthymemes are, things like that, what is he accusing the sophists of being focused on in their arguments or in their definitions of rhetoric? What do they actually teach? Try to arouse emotion from people? Yeah, what they're trying to do is play on people's emotions and prejudices, right? So they're just trying to make personal appeals to the judge rather than making an argument about the facts of the case, right? So all they're trying to teach is how to arouse people's emotions, not how to weigh arguments against each other, or not how to construct a valid evidence-based argument, right, which should be the only standard in a court of law. Um, so does anybody, is anybody familiar with this word he uses, enthymeme, this thing that he accuses the sophists of having no interest in? Is this anything anybody's seen before? OK, so how many of you guys remember what a syllogism is? We definitely covered this. We definitely talked about this. A goal? What's that? A goal? It's not a goal. A syllogism is a kind of method of reasoning, right? So um, maybe, maybe this will jar your memory a little bit. All humans are mortal. Socrates is human. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Does this look familiar to anybody? OK, we all remember this, right? So yes, yeah, so syllogism is a means of testing whether a particular proposition is logical or not, right? An enthymeme is a syllogism with one of these premises left out, right? So we have the general proposition we're trying to prove, right? which is, sorry, this at the bottom, that Socrates is mortal. If all humans are mortal and Socrates is human, then Socrates is mortal. And we have two supporting premises in a syllogism, right? In an enthymeme, you only get one supporting premise, and the other premises are implied, right? So to give you an example of what this looks like, uh, there's an old Burger King ad. A bigger burger, is a better burger. The burgers are bigger at Burger King, right? So what is the implied premise here? That the burgers are what at Burger King? Are bigger at Burger King? Well, that's stated, right? That's an explicit premise. That the burgers are bigger at Burger King. So what's the implied premise? The burgers are better at Burger King. That the burgers are better at Burger King because they're bigger, right? So <clears throat> this is the kind of thing that Aristotle's talking about here, right? So an enthymeme in Greek rhetoric is kind of similar to what a thesis statement is for us, or it's the basic unit that they build an argument on. So what he is saying here is that the sophists have no interest in either arguments or supporting premises, right? What they are interested in is gestures and tone of voice and playing on your feelings, right? Okay, so that does give us some sense of what Aristotle's values are here, right? What does he think 
a rhetorician needs to pay most attention to? What does he seem to think a rhetorician needs to pay least attention to? What's most important for a good speaker? To present fact instead of feelings. Okay, yeah, fact over feeling is a big part of this, right? Get people to accept fact rather than playing on their feelings. And I'm trying to find the And what does he say about people? What, what, what's his belief about human beings and their relationship to rhetoric and to truth? What does he say people will naturally tend to do when considering arguments? Yeah, that people tend to naturally gravitate towards truth and justice anyway, right? Right, that arguments that are in and of themselves true and just are already easier for people to accept. So, if the true and just <coughs> argument fails, whose fault is it? Speakers. Yeah, it's the speakers, and why? Yeah, like if you can't present a case that is true and just in a way that people will accept it, right? In a way that people will accept your arguments, then clearly the fault is on you because you don't know how to address an audience, right? So while the true and just arguments will tend to prevail, you still need skilled speakers to defend them, right? To protect audiences from unscrupulous people who are just gonna try to play on their feelings. All right, to follow up on that here, right? Moreover, before some audiences, not even the possession of the exactest knowledge will make it easy for what we say to produce a conviction. For argument based on knowledge implies instruction and there are people whom one cannot instruct. So what kinds of audiences is he talking about? What kind of audiences is he talking about here? Who is he talking about trying to reach? Before some audiences, not even the possession of the exactest knowledge will make it easy for what we say to produce conviction. For argument based on knowledge implies instruction, and there are some people whom one cannot instruct. Who's he talking about trying to argue to here? Well, probably not to the sophists specifically, but this might be the kind of situation where their techniques come in handy. Um, what he's talking about more here is people who are, people who are ignorant, right? He's talking about, um, speaking to an audience 
that does not possess the rudimentary level of education necessary to grasp the argument, right? And so what he's saying with people who are with people who are ignorant, um, one has to use emotion as a means of persuasion, right? Right here, then, we must use our modes of persuasion and argument, notions possessed by everybody, as we observe in the topics when dealing with the way to handle a popular audience. So you have to deal with notions, you know, notions that are shared by everybody, i.e. feelings, right? Because then you're not talking over your audience's head. So <laughs> feelings, are really only an appropriate means of persuasion when nothing else will work, right? If you're dealing with people whom you cannot reach with appeals to reason, Nothing but feelings is going to do it, right? <clears throat> Further, we must be able to employ persuasion, just as strict reasoning can be employed, on opposite sides of a question, not in order that we, we may in practice employ it in both ways, for we must not make people believe what is wrong, but in order that we may see clearly what the facts are, and that if another man argues unfairly, we, on our part, may be able to confute him. So what's the third of these uh, premises he comes up with about the usefulness of rhetoric? What is he saying a good speaker needs to be able to do? Argues both sides. Yeah, you need to at the very least understand multiple sides of the question. Because if you don't understand the other, you know, the other side to the question, then your opponents will dismantle you more easily, and you won't be able to come at them, right? So you must be able to understand more than one side of the issue. as this will make your own argument stronger, right? Again, it is absurd to hold that a man ought to be ashamed of being unable to defend himself with his limbs, but not of being unable to defend himself with speech and reason when the use of rational speech is more distinctive of a human being than the use of his limbs. And if it be objected that one who uses such power of speech unjustly might do great harm, that is a charge which may be made in common against all good things except virtue, and above, all, and above all, against the things that are most useful, such as strength, health, wealth, generalship. A man can confer the greatest of benefits by a right use of these, and inflict the greatest of injuries by using them wrongly. So, how is he responding here to Plato's? idea of rhetoric. How is he responding to his teacher's take on rhetoric? What's all this talk about defending yourself? It is absurd to hold that a man ought to be ashamed of being unable to defend himself with his limbs, right? So what's he talking about there, literally? Defending yourself with your limbs. Like a physical action? Yeah, being able to fight, right? If so, you know, somebody jumps you in a dark alley, right? Being able to defend yourself, to fight back, right? So he's saying it's absurd that somebody should be ashamed of being unable to defend himself with his limbs. That somebody should be ashamed of not being able to fight but not of being unable to defend himself with speech and reason. So 
you should be ashamed of not being able to fight, but you shouldn't be ashamed of not being able to argue. Especially when argument, like speech and reason, he's saying are things that distinguish us from animals, right? These are things that human beings can do that animals cannot. So why should we be ashamed to use these human attributes, right? To defend maybe not our bodies or our persons, but our positions, right? Why should we not be willing to use the means at our disposal to defend the things that we believe in and the things that you know we think of, that we think are important, right? Whereas Plato would argue that to do this is to wander away from truth, right? If you're concerned with defending yourself verbally, if you're concerned with using argument as a defensive tool, then you are not seeking truth. You're not getting any closer to that you know, elusive goal of absolute truth. So, <clears throat> which of these is making more sense to you? Do you think that Aristotle's making more sense or that Plato's making more sense and why? Yeah, I agree more with Aristotle, but the way, personally, just the way Plato was written was more understandable to me than Aristotle's. Yeah, um, placing it in the mouths of characters having a conversation, mm -hmm. um, like, it can be confusing that it's not always clear who's advocating for what position, but there is at least a kind of back and forth there, right? And it's maybe a little bit less dry. Um, yeah, Aristotle tends to write in a very kind of dry, expository kind of way, right? Um, I mean, what, 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 about, what about the rest of you? Like, like if, if we're just kind of breaking down these positions, right, about rhetoric as a tool or rhetoric as a means of getting at truth, right, which of these positions makes the most sense to you so far? Okay. Yeah, okay, that is, as long as you are doing this responsibly, right? You are elevating facts over feelings. You're not just trying to plan emotional prejudices. Okay. What about the rest of you? Definitely Aristotle. Just because, like, I don't know, it seems like if you argue for the truth, Yeah, I think we might also want to think about the relationship between rhetoric and democracy, right? Um, do we live in a society in which one narrative or one version of truth is naturally promoted over all others, at least ideally speaking? Political issues have so many ways you can look at them, and it depends like where you come from or where you stand, or like, even religious, like mm -hmm. where you stand on that certain issue. Yeah, and kind of like much like was the case in ancient Athens, right? Whose vision wins out depends on how well they can argue for it, right, and how many people they can convince, right? So you know, if you can't convince people to vote for your particular vision, right? then <clears throat> your vision is not going to prevail. Now, you know, there are some you know, means baked into the system that tend to promote the success of some visions over others, right? Some, you know, some particular visions of what the country should be like 
have baked in structural advantages. But at least in the, in the abstract, right, the ideal is that all ideas are supposed to get an equal shot to make their case. Or, you know, the, you know the, the First Amendment guarantees freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion, right? That, you know, the, the, the state will not establish or control any of those. Um, so, yeah, if you live in a democratic society, then rhetoric is probably more immediately useful to you than at least Plato's vision of what philosophy is meant to do, right? I think that you know, like philosophy can provide a kind of powerful underpinning to um, social thought, but you still have to be able to argue for the particular vision that you want to you want to build, that you want to come to fruition, right? Um, okay. So. Let's turn quickly here to page 136. Where he starts talking about <clears throat> the principles of rhetoric, right? So can I get somebody to read um, beginning of section two here? Rhetoric may be defined as the fact of observing. Okay, go for it. Okay, thank you. So think back again to the Gorgias, right? What does Socrates keep asking Gorgias about to get him to define what rhetoric is? What does he keep bringing up to him to get him to refine his definition? Like the specific purpose of the art? Yeah, so it's like, okay, well, so the physician persuades people and instructs them about medicine, right? The trainer um, persuades and informs people about exercise, right? So what's special about what you do? And how is Aristotle trying to resolve that question here? He says it's not really concerned with anything specific. It's more you can use it and apply it to different things. Yeah, what, what he's defining rhetoric as is a kind of general science of persuasion, right? anything that has to do with persuasion. So, for example, could the physician, if he's not also skilled in rhetoric, convince you about things other than medicine? Not over the rhetorician, right? The mathematician can't convince or instruct you of things outside of mathematics, right? So I think what Aristotle is arguing here is that these other, um, <clears throat> you know, these other scholars are focused on these specific fields and on persuasion and instruction within those particular fields. And the rhetorician is a generalist, right, who is focused solely on how best to persuade an audience. Can I get somebody uh, to start reading uh, the last paragraph on page 136 right, of, the, of the modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word? I yeah, thank you, Carrie. Of the modes of persuasion furnished by the spoken word, there are three kinds. The first kind depends on the personal character of the speaker. The second, on putting the audience into a certain frame of mind. The third, on the proof or apparent proof. 
provided by the words of the speech itself. Persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character when the speech is so spoken as to make us think incredible. We believe good men more fully and more readily than others. This is true generally, whatever the question is. And obviously, oh, absolutely true, mm -hmm. where exact certainty is impossible and opinions are divided. This kind of persuasion, like others, should be achieved by what the speaker says, not by what people think of his character before he begins to speak. It is not true, as some writers assume in their treatises on rhetoric, that the personal goodness revealed by the speaker contributes nothing to his power of persuasion. On the contrary, his character may almost be called the most effective means of persuasion he possesses. Secondly, persuasion may come through the hearers, which speech stirs their emotion. Our judgments mm -hmm. when we are pleased and friendly are not the same as when we are pained and hostile. It is towards producing these effects, as we maintain, that present day writers of rhetoric direct the whole of their efforts. This subject shall be treated in detail when we come to speak of the emotions. Thirdly, persuasion is affected through the speech itself when we have provided a proof, proved a truth on an apparent truth by means of persuasion, persuasive argument suitable to the case in question. Okay, so here he's talking about that logos, pathos, ethos thing that we discussed last time, right? And how does he seem to rank these three things. Do we remember what all of these things meant, what, what all these terms meant, by the way? What's logos? Logic. Yes, logic, appeal to reason, right? Pathos? Yep. Think things like, you know, pathetic, sympathy, empathy, right? And ethos? Authority and character. Yep, authority and character, right, good. And which of these does he regard as most important? From his point of view, which which of these three does he think is most important? The authority and character. Yeah, he puts ethos as number one, right? That while he does seem to elevate fact over feeling, right? In his scheme of which of these appeals is most important, the character of the speaker, right? Seems to be the most powerful persuasive measure for him, right? That the speaker demonstrates that he or she is a person of you know, depth of knowledge and good character, right? Where does he seem to rank the other two? Right, given some of the other stuff that he said about arousing the feelings, right? But how does he justify placing pathos second? What does he accept that you have to do in order to get an audience to listen to? Well, how, how do you um, how do you get them to judge you more favorably? You need to get them to be more pleased and friendly. Yeah, you got to put the audience in a receptive frame of mind, right? You have to, you know, <clears throat> you have to make them sympathetic to you, friendly with you, right? In order for them to listen to anything you have to say. And then Logos, seems to be the least important um, after character and emotion, right? Um, what do you guys think of this scheme? Like, like, do you think 
that this makes sense, or would you revise this in some way? What would you think is actually the most important thing to get somebody to listen to or pay attention to an argument? I mean, I think that's logical because if you have people who are already against Mm -hmm. So you need to start by being like, and if you're like generally a bad person, no one's going <laughs> to trust what you say. Okay, now he does say that the, the speakers, uh, that you know, the speakers shouldn't be judged by their pre-established character, right? But you know, instead by the way they speak and present themselves, right? But at the same, yeah, like yeah, we don't listen to people we don't like, right? We don't listen to people we already don't trust. Um, there's actually, you know, there's, there's been, um, particularly, you know, given the current divided nature of our politics, there's actually, you know, there's been some research done on what it takes to convince somebody to accept, um, you know, a particular fact or whatever. And, you know, what most of the evidence seems to fall on is that it has to come from somebody they trust. Right? That it doesn't matter, you know, how much information you throw at somebody. It doesn't necessarily matter how much you play on their feelings, um, particularly if you're talking about something in which issues of personal identity are caught up. People are only going to listen if it's coming from someone they already know and trust. Um, so yeah, I, I think that you know Aristotle actually had a pretty good sense of that. Like, what about what do the rest of you think of this? Like, what why do you think what do you think about putting reason so low here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, yeah. if I say something blatantly offensive, right, that affects your view of my character, then I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to either put you in a receptive frame of mind or get you to accept information that I offer to you, right? Um, yeah. So, and I, I, I think like you know, it may even come down here to like not to what is actually most important in convincing people, but I think in like what's easiest to swallow. first. Like, okay, this person seems to be of good character and to know what they're talking about. I will allow them to put me in a receptive frame of mind, and then once I'm in a receptive frame of mind, I will accept the information they give me, right? So I think it's probably not here, maybe it's best not to think of Logos as being kind of like the least important, but as being like, like the kind of thing that is least easy for someone to accept without these other two, you know, kind of uh, these other two things kind of sugarcoating it a little bit, right? Because I mean, what happens to you if somebody just like presents you with a, a bunch of raw facts without any context, without any explanation, without trying to talk to you about them? You just go, like, right over your head. Yeah, who gives a shit, right? Who cares? Uh, yeah, go ahead. I also think like, like if we like. Let's say like logos was a thing like will you still accept the authority or character's statements just based off of how you think them? Like, I don't know. Like is reason really a big factor when you look at the person a certain way? Yeah, and I think like we you use logos, you use reason to build ethos, right? It's one of the things you want to present yourself as is knowledgeable. But I think, you know, um, what is what is being demonstrated here is that you can't just be knowledgeable, right? You also have to seem caring and approachable and responsible, right? You know, there are plenty of people who are knowledgeable 
who are not those other things as well, right? So, <clears throat> let's um, turn back here slightly and talk a little bit about um, how he frames this difference between what he calls forensic and political authorities. These aren't the same thing. What is forensic oratory? Does anybody know? Pardon? Oh yes, there is there is a footnote, yes. <laughs> So yeah, so there's a difference between oratory that's used to establish legal facts, right? Right, whether or not someone committed a particular act at a particular time to a particular person, right? You know, did you or did you not steal that box of handkerchiefs, right? Did you or did you not, uh, you know, murder poor old Mrs. Henderson, right? And political rhetoric, political oratory, in which you are trying to decide between multiple viewpoints or forces of action, right? With no obviously true or false result. So when you're engaged in forensic oratory, what's the only thing you need to be able to do? A black back to someone's guilt or innocence? Yeah, all that matters is whether or not you can muster enough evidence to prove that this particular thing did or didn't happen, right? So all that really matters is logos, or is reason, is information, right? But most serious questions in any given society are going to fall into the latter category, right? Where there is no clear right or wrong answer. And I think like this is the thing that a writer like Aristotle wants to prepare the citizen slash reader for, right? how to navigate a society in which you are frequently going to be asked to choose between different courses of action that are both backed up by justifications, right? And that is, I think, at least for me, like the most important reason to study rhetoric, right, is to understand, one, when people are being manipulative, right? Developing a bullshit detector is a very important thing to be able to do in a democratic society. Um, and also to be able to defend your own viewpoint when you need to get other people on board with your project, right? You need to be able to explain to people why you think what you think and try to convince them that they should think the same way, right? Because ideally, that's how society is supposed to work. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I kind of wanted to make rhetoric the last thing that we talk about um, in these, you know, these, like the last set of readings, right? So we talked about you know, education primarily in the first two sets, and we're still talking here about education, but you know, I also want us to think about how education 
can help us get along with each other and can help us participate in civil society. So that's why we're doing this, this stuff with rhetoric. And that's really all I have for you guys today. The Aristotle piece was really short um, and is you know, very much a kind of informational thing, right? You know, this, is, this is what this is and this is how it should be applied. And there's really not much to debate or discuss about it, right? Um, so the John Quincy Adams piece you're reading for next time is going to be directly concerned with the relationship between rhetoric and ideas of liberty, right? So try to keep that in mind as you're reading. Um, and remember, right, that exploratory reflection is due tonight. Um, if you have trouble with it, if you need extra time, whatever, just you know, let me know. Um, I'm happy to talk it over with you. All right, so we'll see you on Thursday.